So, uh, so this is uh, uh, one of the three reading questions that you have seen on this set, and um, I thought uh, since it's questions on your set, it might be uh, worth going through. Uh, the way I have it set up in in your problem set, you could basically guess to the correct answer. You have hundred tries, no penalties for <laughs> guessing wrong. So, um, so it's with all of that in mind that I don't mind just giving you the answer with explanations because with all this stuff, um, what matters is that you understand the content, not whether or not you get it correct or, or wrong. So, uh, so it says for an object whose position is given by this function, okay, so that's uh, its x position, as a function of, I guess, just time, plus v, the quantity v is called, ah, it's a, it's a vocabulary test, and uh, after you've read it through the textbook and or watch the lectures, you, you should know the names for, there are, um, let's see, I guess, three constant parameters here, a, Omega, by the way, I've seen call, people call this W. It's not W, it's Omega um, and V. Time T is, it's a, it's a variable. It's a, your coordinate variable. So um, it's time, you don't really need a name for that. So each of these constant parameters, um, they have a specific meaning in describing oscillation and they're given a name. This A, it's called amplitude. So in your multiple choice, it's not one of your answers. And this omega, um, I will give you two alternate names for it. Sometimes you will hear it called angular velocity, and that's the choice you see there. Sometimes you will hear it called angular frequency. And the, the name angular frequency um, connects it most closely to this relationship between omega and frequency f, uh, which is, is the relationship is 2 pi times the frequency f is angular frequency. And um, in a lot of the contexts, you might see these being used interchangeably. And, and that's fine. In a lot of the contexts, they are interchangeable, um, especially if you have something that's uh, moving in a circular motion then these are just completely interchangeable. Um, what I will say is that as we talk about oscillations in more general terms, you will see me prefer this term more because it's not always the case that when you have something that can be described as the cycles and frequency and angular frequency, that there's an actual physical velocity you can associate it with. Um, so something like a, a, a mass on a spring. So when you have a mass on a spring, if it's undergoing a linear motion, it doesn't really have an angular frequency, angular velocity. It might have velocity, but um, with the mass on a spring, if you try to write down velocities, angular velocity times r, you're gonna get into trouble because there's no radius. Um, so you, you will see me prefer angular frequency more over the term angular velocity. But um, in many contexts, you will see these interchangeably and you should be aware of that. Um, in any case, the quantity V, it's called a phase or phase factor. Um, it's called phase, um, or I guess in this case, phase shift, which is fine. The important word here is the word phase. Sometimes you will hear phase factor or phase shift or maybe e even something like initial phase. Um, in all these different phrases you could have for phi or phi, the important word here is the word phase. And in fact, it's in the context where a phase matters more and more, you will see me use the word angular frequency because um, you know when we get more into phase angle as opposed to physical angle, that's where you can still talk about frequency, but you can't really talk about velocity. There's no tangential velocity to think of. So, now, in terms of answering it, you could have answered a lot more quickly than I did. I'm just explaining stuff. 
All right, let me look at next two questions. Um, for an object in simple harmonic motion, sometimes abbreviated SHM or um, SHO for simple harmonic oscillator, uh, which two motion graphs are 180 degree out of phase? Oh, um, yeah, so it, uh, you, it easy is to, to think of this in with some example in mind. Imagine you have position of some uh, mass on a spring that's described with the uh, amplitude, some trig function, and we'll make the phase factor equal to zero so that I can just say to cosine of omega t. Then I can write down what velocity and acceleration graphs should look like. Velocity is a function of time. It's given by derivative of position. <laughs> <laughs> we are bringing back all the stuff from kinematics that we introduced. And, and this time it's going to be interesting because acceleration is in constant. So taking time derivative to do this. Um, so A is constant. Derivative of cosine is minus sine. And uh, I use chain rule to take the derivative of the inside. I get an omega. So that's going to be multiplying. So it should be, let me write it out in a form that makes this process um, easiest to see. A constant times derivative of the outside minus a sine omega t. And because this inside is not a simple just a t, I need to use chain rule to apply that, take the derivative of the inside the function omega times t, and then get to me a function omega. And uh, when you get used to this kind of math, uh, oftentimes you will pull out this vector to the front and get something like minus a omega sine omega t. Okay, sine and cosine are 90 degrees out of phase with each other. So I guess it's a velocity is not the answer here. Let's go to acceleration. You get acceleration the same way you got velocity, just to, it's the next step. You take the time derivative velocity to get acceleration. Again, all the stuff from kinematics coming back. So um, here I'm going to use the shortcut. Um, so sine of uh, derivative sine is cosine. Um, so I'm going to turn this into cosine when I write it down. And the chain rule will give me an additional factor of omega out. These are constants. I, nothing happens to them. So with all that, it's going to be minus a omega squared times cosine of omega t. Ah. So I have the same function back for acceleration. and um, and, and uh, with a minus sign, which will give me a trig function that's a 180 degree out of phase. So the answer here should be position and acceleration. By the way, uh, there's a way to get at this answer without going through this math. You can go through a different math called equation of motion. When you are de describing oscillation, this is an equation of motion that you should have seen derived um, in lecture and in textbook which says the second time derivative position is equal to minus k over m times x as a function of time. This is the equation of motion for mass on a spring. And uh, this actually tells you that uh, this function, uh, when you take two time derivatives, or so you know this is your acceleration, and you get the same function back as position, with this extra minus sign. Um, that would have told you right from the start that position and acceleration are going to be 180 degrees out of phase. But that maybe requires a bit more abstract reasoning. So this is, in some sense, easier. You can just chalk through the math and see that, oh, same function, minus sign. So something like that. And, and one more question. This is the last of the reading questions. It asks, which statement is true concerning the energy of a horizontal mass spring system? Oh, I drew that before. I, let me just read the statement. And, um, <laughs> let me draw it. I have to draw it to think through. OK, horizontal spring connected to some mass. And we are assuming there is some kind of a frictionless plane to support all this. Okay, um, and uh, so let's say this is starting out at, as an equilibrium position, 
and it's going to be oscillating with some amplitude back and forth and so on. Okay, so the mass has zero potential energy at the center of the oscillation. Okay, that could be right. It has zero spring potential energy for sure. But let me read you through the remainder of the choices because but the thing about potential energy is it's only meaningful um, in terms of the difference in potential energy. So uh, zero potential energy can be a uh, meaningless statement. <laughs> so let me read you through the rest of the two to see if they are incorrect. Um, the mass has maximum kinetic energy at the same moment it has maximum potential energy. Okay, that is incorrect. It does have maximum potential energy at the ends where it turns around then you know from this conservation of energy consideration this should sound wrong because if a total energy is conserved and you have uh, total energy is equal to potential energy plus kinetic energy then whenever one of them is maximum the other should be at minimum so the mass has zero kinetic energy at the center of the oscillation ah, and that's definitely wrong because at the center of the oscillation um, the potential energy at a minimum, that I can say, whether it's zero or not, I can say it's at a min local minimum. So kinetic energy should be a maximum. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, let me not overthink it. One of the ways I like to think through mathematical or abstract situation is to think of counterexamples. And I can think of a counterexample to someone saying, oh, this statement is always wrong, um, saying that, so, if uh, your function for oscillation is this, x as a function of time is zero, then yes, the mass has a zero kinetic energy because it has zero kinetic energy for all time. It also has zero potential energy for all time. Um, but that to me just uh, being difficult, not <laughs> being good at test taking. So, so these are the three reading questions. Hopefully they were uh, not hard, easy. Took less time for you to do it than me just doing it now.